So one of the most visible projects that the Robert H. Jackson Center handles every year is our internship program. For 10 weeks each summer, from the beginning of June, typically until the middle of August, we uh, welcome five students from around the country to spend the summer with us learning about Robert H. Jackson, helping us with projects, exploring their interests as well. And I hope you've had the opportunity to meet and chat with some of them. But one of the things they do each summer as well is put together a year in review video. And we give them very little direction on this because it is their opportunity to learn about what the center is and what the center does. And we like to see our work through their eyes as well. So this is the, the event at which this video debuts every year. And so if you would turn your attention to the screen. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Robert H. Jackson Center. Are you ready to reflect on our year with us? Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Last year, on July 31st, the Center, in partnership with the Chautauqua Institution, hosted the 19th annual Jackson Lecture on the Supreme Court of the United States. A lecture was given by Justin Driver, the Robert R. Slaughter Professor of Law and Counselor to the Dean at Yale Law School, in light of the Supreme Court's decision for the recent case, Students for Fair Admission v. Harvard which ruled that the Harvard Admissions Program violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Driver stated that affirmative action, quote, played a significant role in creating and bolstering the black middle and upper middle classes, and we should, in my view, salute it for that vital work. We should place it right up there with the GI Bill as an engine of mobility that has shaped and improved modern America. In August, the Jackson Center hosted the 15th Annual International Humanitarian Law Round Table. Brenda J. Hollis was awarded the Heinz Humanitarian Achievement Award for her compassion, vision, and dedication in pursuit of international humanitarian justice. The International Humanitarian Law Round Table brings together chief prosecutors and judges from international courts and tribunals and international leaders and scholars to the institution each year. Jackson's legal and humanitarian legacy is remembered and passed on through lectures and work groups. Our center explored new programming with the introduction of the community discussion format, aiming to bring the surrounding community into the center to learn about different current events from experts, facilitating dialogue in an accepting and judgment-free environment. On June 7th, the Robert H. Jackson Center hosted a community discussion conducted by Professor John Q. Barrett on the legacy of and current challenges to one of the Supreme Court's most significant decisions. In Barnett, the Supreme Court decided, and Justice Robert H. Jackson wrote the court's opinion explaining that it is unconstitutional for government to compel school children to salute and to pledge allegiance to the American flag. On August 15th, Professor Atiba Ellis the Laura B. Chisholm Distinguished Research Scholar and Professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Law led a community discussion about the historic view of voting rights and election security and the recent Supreme Court cases reshaping how we practice our democracy. Professor Ellis, in partnership with the Robert H. Jackson Center, also hosted a series of masterclasses, Democracy at the Turning Point, Representation, Fairness, and America's Third Century at the Chautauqua Institution, which discussed how the basic structures of elections have been under attack by disinformation, legal erosion, and authoritarianism. On September 21st, more than 100 students attended the Center's Constitution Day program with Justice Mark Montour and Judge Darlene Lay, sponsored in part by the Randall J. Sweeney Education Fund. Justice Montour is a judge in the New York State Appellate Division's 4th Judicial Department, which serves Central and Western New York. He was appointed by Governor Hochul in 2022 and is the first Native American to serve in New York State's Appellate Division. He also serves as the chair of the New York Tribal Courts Committee. He had an honest conversation with the students about the historical attitudes of the U.S. government toward Native Americans and how those communities also influenced the U.S. government. Judge Lay is a member of the Seneca Nation and was elected in 2009 to serve on the Seneca Nation's Peacemakers Court, an alternative to the county court system that can hear civil actions. 
The Peacemakers Court helps solve local issues in a way that honors traditional Native American models of decision making. She spoke to the students about her path to the Peacemakers Court, how the judges on that court are elected and not required to have law degrees, and explained in detail some of the cases she has heard and the resolutions. On October 24th, the Center virtually hosted author Lynn Olson as this year's Al and Marge Brown speaker on World War II. Lynn Olson is a New York Times bestselling author of nine books of history, including three New York Times bestsellers. Before becoming a full-time author, she worked as a journalist for 10 years, first with the Associated Press as a national feature writer in New York, a foreign correspondent in AP's Moscow Bureau, and a political reporter in Washington. She discussed her writing process and her research on the relationship between the United States and Great Britain during World War II. On December 5th, the Center had a virtual conversation with our former board member and chair, David Cray, on continued war in Ukraine. Cray, who was chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, offered insights from his perspective and what the international community sees going forward with justice mechanisms. Cray is currently assisting the international community in the creation of a special tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression. From December 7th to 10th, through the American Society of International Law, Robert A. Jackson Center President Kristen McMahon had the opportunity to go to Lviv, Ukraine, for the Center for the Rule of Law Summit, which commemorated the 75th anniversary of the Genocide Conventions and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, both adopted by the United Nations in 1948. The conference, which the Center also co-sponsored, brought together at least 75 Ukrainian law practitioners and academics throughout the world for roundtable discussions. The goals of the conference were to reaffirm commitment to fundamental principles of international law, respond to the call of the Ukrainian legal community for partnership, and reflect on the path forward for international law. It was a reminder of how Jackson's international law legacy continues to remain relevant and how organizations like the Center must continue to keep conversations about Ukraine ongoing outside of the region. On February 21st, we celebrated Jackson Day in Warren County with keynote speaker Elizabeth Hurst, the first woman to serve as district attorney in Erie County, Pennsylvania. She discussed the significance of civic engagement in bettering our communities and shared her passion for public service the special care for children and stemmed the tide of violence in her community. Her early prosecutions and child abuse have shaped her understanding of her position, a deep commitment to public service. As she eloquently states, it requires more than just doing my job in an efficient way. It requires unwavering dedication to those that I serve and as a public servant, I am accountable to the community. Throughout her 20 years in the district attorney's office, Hearst has prosecuted a range of criminal cases, including homicides, crimes against children, and other major felonies. She now heads the office of 16 assistant district attorneys, 9 county detectives, and many other legal and supporting staff. Every summer, the Jackson Center welcomes students across the nation to learn about the legacy and principles of Robert H. Jackson. While the internship only lasts 10 weeks, the influence resonates far beyond that period. The experience leaves an enduring mark on the students' academic pursuit, inspiring them to continue exploring international law and social justice. Beginning her research as a summer intern in 2021, Sarah Godfrey published an article this year through the Global Accountability Network that evaluates the prosecution of forced marriages in international courts. Her article, Reviewing the Prosecution of the Forced Marriage of Women and Girls in International Courts, Inhumane Act or Form of Sexual Slavery explores the evolution of forced marriage in international law, a crime that she argues has too often been confined to charges of sexual violence alone. She began her research using the Center's archives and vast sources on the Nuremberg era and was connected with David Crane, the former board member of the Jackson Center and the founder of the Global Accountability Network. After her internship, she joined the Global Accountability Network and began her research article on forced marriage with David Crane. Like Sarah, Every summer intern is grateful for the Jackson Center's extensive resources and tremendous support in their academic pursuits. This summer, the Jackson Center continued its tradition of hosting a group of five interns. This year's interns are Nick Farrelly Jackson, Jude Gotchel, Andrew Jin, Maddie Russell, and Kohoi Yan. The summer interns are incredibly grateful to the donors at the Jackson Center for making this internship program possible. It truly has been a summer to remember.
The Jackson Center is full of exciting events to close out 2024, and we would love to see you at them. On Monday, July 29th, Chautauqua Institution and the Robert H. Jackson Center will be welcoming law professor and writer Kate Shaw for the 20th annual Robert H. Jackson Lecture on the Supreme Court of the United States. Shaw is a constitutional, administrative, and legislation law professor at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. She previously worked in the Obama White House Counsel's Office and served as a law clerk for Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. She is also a co-host of the Supreme Court podcast, Strict Scrutiny. This lecture will be in the Chautauqua Institution's Hall of Philosophy, and attending it requires a Chautauqua Institution gate pass. Dr. Karen Korematsu will speak at the Robert H. Jackson Center for Constitution Day on September 17th at 10 a.m. in the Carl Kappa Theater. She's the founder and president of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute and the daughter of Fred Korematsu, the late civil rights icon. Dr. Karen Korematsu is a national speaker who advocates for civil liberties, social justice, civics, and ethnic studies education throughout the country. We are thrilled to have her with us on Constitution Day. The Robert H. Jackson Center is also honored to be one of 12 host sites for Voices and Votes, Democracy in America, a traveling Smithsonian exhibit that integrates the resources of the host community and institutions to explore, reflect on, and tell the story of their role in the evolution of American democracy and envision the future of our nation. The exhibit will be in the banquet room from September 6th to October 18th. The exhibit also includes an oral history component where participants can record their own reflections on democracy for preservation. Anyone interested in recording a story is encouraged to contact the Jackson Center at 716-483-6646 or info at roberthjackson.org to set up a time to record. As the Jackson Center looks towards the future, we have a few long-term goals. We would like to be better positioned to serve more diverse and greater numbers of patrons. To achieve these goals, we will hire a dedicated director of programs. We also plan to search for a director of marketing and communications. If you're excited to learn more about the details, our beloved president, Kristen McMahon, will talk more about the new positions very soon in her State of the Center talk. We are also collaborating with Cardwell Beach to develop a new website that will improve access to archival materials for researchers and comprehensively showcase information about Robert Jackson, his principles, his work, and his legacy, as well as the work of the Center. Jackson's legacy and how it comes alive through the modern lens applied by the Center's programs and exhibits helps contextualize the issues society currently faces, encourages more compassion because we remember chapters of history where there was none, inspires more courage to uphold justice and the rule of just law when we witness injustices, and offers greater assurance that the only way up is to improve. The Jackson Center thanks all our donors and volunteers for their support, and we cannot wait to share more about our projects and events in 2024 and beyond. If you have not yet had the opportunity to speak with them, I highly encourage you to do so. They will... All right, so now it is time for the State of the Center. It is an incredible work environment to have a board and supporters that not only trust me to dream big about what the center could be and what the center could accomplish and the impact it can have on our local, national, and international communities. They also encourage me to do so, so they can join in the aspirations and the inspirations. For the last several years, it has been my practice to come up with a word to describe the state, the state of the center. And this year, I am torn between a couple of words, and since I get to set the rules, I get to, I get to do a break, break with that tradition a little bit. I would like to set the context for just about everything that you will hear. These words are on Robert H. Jackson's headstone, and we have also replicated them on the base of our flagpole. And the words are, he kept the ancient landmarks and built the new. So the two concepts I have chosen for the state of the center this year are foundations <laughs> and building blocks. We, the team, the board, as well as all of you in this room are keenly aware of the historic legacy on which we stand, from which we derive our direction and to which we look for inspiration and guidance. Last year at this dinner, I walked you through the goals and the plans of the center's board and team, and we spent a good portion of our time since then 
working on putting the pieces in place to help us achieve these goals. This work is not as visible to the outside of our wonderful organization, so I want to bring you all inside so you see and understand what we have been doing. And this will give you a sense of our ambitions and our direction and our successes thus far. And to help visualize that, because for some people that's a little easier, feel free to peruse the visual that's towards the back of the room. For most of 2024, we have been working on our virtual front door, our website. We launched an RFP process last year and chose a company that had a clear passion for helping us create a web presence that more accurately reflects the contemporary relevance of Jackson's principles and how that is reflected in our programs and resources. It will engage a variety of audiences in the way they want to be engaged, whether that is following the day-by-day -day timeline of the Nuremberg trials, looking for conversation to understand a contemporary issue, or delving deep to gain insight into Jackson's legacy, and of course, how to support all of the work that we're doing. We anticipate launching this website by early fall. We are adding talent to our team to continue to improve upon the quality of our programs, resources, and how we engage with our audiences, both virtually and in person. The search process for our inaugural director of programs has not been completed with alacrity, but it has enabled us to get crystal clear on the attributes and skills we need in this role. And I look forward to sharing more with you on this in the near future. And this is only the first step in our road of expanding our team, which will enable us to better serve our constituencies' needs for education, information, and guidance. We have been submitting grant applications, so many grant applications, and having conversations with funders, our communities, donors, educators, and students, and our government officials. We have submitted these applications locally, regionally, and nationally to bring both the center and its work to the attention of these additional organizations, which helps to raise our profile, as well as the, diversify those who support our mission and work. These applications have been submitted to support our capacity building endeavors and are really a critical part of those building blocks that I mentioned. The expansion of the team, how we share Jackson's story throughout our physical space and in our virtual space, and the critical adaption, adaptations that are needed to both of those. Earlier today, as an expression of commitment, the center's board approved an initiative to begin renovating our theater space. This particular phase is about our audiovisual capabilities. One of our directors challenged the board to showcase their commitment, and the board accepted the challenge to help us raise the final third of the funds that we need to kick off this work. We are grateful to all of them. Building and expanding an organization, well, building and expanding anything, as you all know, requires dreams and focus continuous assessment and adaptation, and deeply committed people. And by deeply committed people, I do not just mean our team and our board, but all of you and those who were not able to join us this evening as well. Thank you for being our partners in this work. You know, of course, that I could not do what I do without the wonderful team I have, with Sherry Shutter and Tina Downey and Kenny McDonald and Ed Tomasini, and we, I am so grateful for their, their talents and their contributions to the work that we do. <laughs> you heard mention as well, we have a lot of wonderful volunteers in our life, in addition to our board, our docents, who tell the story of Jackson every day. So thank you to the docents as well. <laughs> and having spent the vast majority of the last 48 hours with our board, I am appreciative that they are all here this evening as well, and many of them will be with us tomorrow. We have had the better part of these two days with open and honest and not always easy conversations, digging into our goals and the strategies for achieving those and dreaming, which is always fun. I would like to make a special note that Professor John Q. Barrett is completing nine years of service on our board this weekend. 
and we extend our deep gratitude to his service and commitment. John has been involved with the center since our beginning, and we look forward to his continued involvement and guidance. We look forward to you joining us tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. at the Hall of Philosophy on the grounds of the institution for the 20th Robert H. Jackson Lecture on the Supreme Court of the United States. What a landmark to hit 20 years. We are delighted to host our speaker, Kate Shaw, this evening, and we look forward to you joining us, all of you, joining us tomorrow afternoon. I would especially like to thank Jill and Arnie Bello and the Bello Family Foundation for their support of this lecture. On the backs of your programs, you will also find a number of upcoming programs, uh, both here at the Jackson Center physically, as well as one in Washington, DC. We do hope that you are able to join us for those. I will highly recommend you check out the Voices and Votes, Democracy in America, Smithsonian Traveling Exhibit. As the interns previewed for you, we are one of only 12 museums that will be hosting this in New York State, and we are incredibly privileged to so do. Many years ago, I read a Harvard Business Review article about gratitude. And I believe it was entitled, Be Grateful More Often. I was trying to Google it and was struggling with, with finding it. What sticks in my memory were the positive impacts, especially resilience and how we cope with stressful circumstances, and also that it strengthens, strengthens our social relationships. That is why we gather here together today to say thank you. I am reminded almost daily how necessary the Jacksonian lens is to think deeply about our challenges and opportunities, to assist in the discussion of civic, legal, humanitarian issues, and to guide just actions. This work is not easy. It has never been easy. But it has been critical, and it remains so today. And we could not do it without you. So my heartfelt thanks to all of you as well. Well, I've been given the task of uh, closing remarks, and I won't keep you here, particularly after you've heard from Kristen, who is so beautifully articulated uh, our mission and how we are working hard to deliver that continually and even better. And as you can see, we are very lucky to have Kristen. She has been such a joy to work with. She has such vision and uh, is bringing us all along with it. And a lot of this is because of all of you. So I just want to again say thank you so much for your support. And uh, we hope to see you in the future. Thanks.